listening to Magic at the Musicals. Welcome to Paul Bernard Kemp's seminar series, Menstruation to Menopause, and today's seminar on parenting and SEI. We hope to break the silence on this very under-resourced area, and we've worked closely with the Spinal Injuries Association, and a massive thank you to them in helping us identify the speakers and working with us on this project. Just by way of housekeeping, this is a recorded seminar, only panellists are visible. We invite you to put any questions in the chat function and we will then look to answer the questions at the end of all of the speakers. We do have a great lineup of speakers today. And I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is Helen Flushel. Helen is an advanced practitioner OT with over 15 years experience of supporting women of all ages with spinal cord injury. Over to you, Helen. Hi, I hope you can hear me okay. So I'm going to whiz through a PowerPoint presentation to start with, and it will be a, a sort of a, a very fast overview of parenting of spinal cord injury. And a lot of it is with regards to things that I've sort of passed on, the main sort of topics of conversation that come up when talking to women who are expecting or are parents with spinal cord injury. So the first thing just to point out is everyone has really different personal parental preferences, which influences how they raise their child. So some of the things we might talk about today, obviously, just to make you aware that what we say might not be what works for you in your home environment, in your family. Um, I think one of the important things to point out, I think when I talk to a lot of women who are spinal cord injured and expecting a child, is that um, it's important to still include the able-bodied parent in any decision-making that's made, any equipment you look at to make sure it's going to work for them as well as yourself. Um, and it's also important to think about what your priorities as a parent are, um, how you're going to manage fatigue, um, because it is hard work bringing up a child even when you're able-bodied. So it's then obviously managing your spinal cord injury on top of that, what your priorities are, whether you want to have more of a play role, more of a caring role within your child's development. I just wanted to touch briefly on um, sort of being a parent at the time of injury because I don't know who I'm talking to today. Like there may be some professionals who are working with um, people with spinal cord injury and rehabilitation. Um, so I think it's really important to involve the child in the rehabilitation progress, um, give them as much information as, obviously, as appropriate, keep regular contact during an inpatient stay so that they um, have opportunity to see what's going on, see how mum um, is, and also have alone time with that um, with that parent as well, so that they're still having that bonding opportunity. Um, ensuring that the the parent who's in hospital is still involved with ongoing decisions and has a, the family have access to a family counsellor as the children as well. Having opportunity to maintain joint hobbies or interests or develop new ones as appropriate for the, the injury. And also to have opportunity to give the child some disability awareness um, and educate them on spinal cord injury. So for those women who are having children since their spinal cord injury, it, one of the things I would like people to take away today is that it's really important to um, take time after you give birth to recover yourself functionally, because the sooner that you can get your stamina back, your independence with any personal care tasks, um, will increase your feelings of control with yourself, which then means you can then focus on the baby. So it's really important just to yeah, take that time, use the midwives when you're in hospital, use your partner if they're on maternity leave when you get home, just to spend that time on yourself, which I know is obviously easier said than done. 
Um, for those of you with higher levels of spinal cord injury who might need a carer, um, it's really important to set boundaries um, with the carer, either through a care plan or communication with them, because you want them to be there to facilitate your role as a parent, not to directly care for the child. So it's it's working out what you're happy for them to do, what you're not happy for them to do, potentially being there while they're actually carrying out the tasks. And also making sure that your carer or your PA is able to accept the differences in how your parenting style might be to their own personal preferences. Um, and I just wanted to include the, the quote at the bottom from a piece of research, which um, was with regards to questionnaires and um, interviews with people with spinal cord injury who are parents and actually the, the emotional bonding, the communication and the quality time together were actually more important to those families with um, spinal cord injury than it was the actual physical aspects of the caring, like changing nappies, that kind of thing. So wheelchairs, with regards to wheelchairs, there are loads of adaptations that you can get. So looking at um, the charities such as Remap or Demand who will do bespoke adaptations. So if you want to look at different things, they're sort of the best companies to call or charities to contact. There are sort of adaptations for either if you're walking or for wheelchairs so you can still self-repel. And there's just some examples on the pictures there. Um, it's important to think about spoke guards as babies are getting to the stage where they're starting to stand up and pull up on everything. You don't, obviously don't want to catch their fingers or for them to damage your chair. So just looking at that could be potentially useful. And also axle positioning. If you're a particularly active user and you've got quite a tippy chair, See if you're carrying a baby on your lap, it obviously changes weight distribution. So thinking about that, potentially tweaking your chair if needed. Um, buggy boards that you can get for um, to go on the back of push chairs for sort of older children can also be attached to wheelchairs. Um, and it is really important, particularly if you're a power chair user, that you consider the combined weight of yourself and the child. Um, particularly with the power chairs and the motors, because it can do, cause damage to them if you're going over the weight limit. There are loads of different slings and carriers on the market generally, um, and options are obviously very dependent on baby's age and their development and head control. Um, for tetraplegics, I would advise avoiding um, the carrier type options that have fastenings. Um, and for those of you who have incomplete injuries who might be walking, it's just to be aware that obviously having a carrier either on your front or your back can affect your dynamics, what we call dynamic standing balance, so when you're moving. Um, but it's advantageous sometimes to consider those options when carrying a child because it obviously leaves your hands free for using walking aids or banisters, rails, those kind of things. It's also worth sort of considering that carrying a child on your person as opposed to using a buggy is obviously more weight, which is obviously going to be more fatiguing for you. Wheelchair user-wise, it's preferable to look at outward facing slings and carriers, just because if you're leaning forward um, on different canvas or to cut hill, um, that you obviously don't want to smother baby. Um, if you can get the carriers which have the, the lift down option at the front, um, it means you're not having to lift baby from such a high position up, you can lift them out from a lower position out of the, the carrier, which can be easier. And just making sure that there's enough space between your chin and baby's head so that if you do go forward or you're going to curve anything like that, that you don't end up bashing heads. Um, as children get older, it's also worth looking at options like having a scarf so you can use it as a seat belt for the child so they don't suddenly jump off and run off. Um, lifting is obviously very um, balance dependent on what the best options are. A lot of um, the parents that I've spoken to in the past have sworn by baby grows and dungarees because they just give you something easier to grab hold of um, for lifting. There's also a blanket product on the market called a snuggle bundle, um, which is quite expensive for what it is, but it can make it a lot easier. You can see it in the picture on the screen. It just means you're lifting from a height to start with and babies contained within it. And you can use those in things like car seats and in and out of the, the cot as well. Car seat wise, car seats are obviously really heavy. Um, I normally recommend to my patients to look at the swivel seat type options. It just makes it easier for clipping children in and out of the, the car. 
And I also sort of recommend around teaching as children get older, thinking about teaching them how to do their own seatbelts as appropriate and obviously safety. You don't want to be driving along and then find they've managed to undo their seatbelt, but it's teaching them those skills early so you don't have to do that anymore. Um, I think sometimes as parents, we often forget about teaching skills like that because we just do it automatically. Um, and you also need to think about car size because if you've got your wheelchair in the car and then a buggy, it's making sure everything is going to fit in safely. There's one. High chairs, there are loads available on the market and we recommend to just go to a shop and look at the different options, see what's going to work for you with your chair. Um, looking at height adjustable ones, so then it's, they're at the right height for you. Um, looking at how the legs were, how sort of far out they come. Obviously the more diagonal they are, the more stability you can, can have with the, the high chair, but then it can make wheelchair access harder, or foot plate access more difficult. Um, some of the, the different high chairs on the market will have the tray that can be released, which can make it easier for lifting the child in and out. Um, but obviously if you're tetraplegic, it's then looking at the mechanism to make sure that you have the hand function to be able to do that. Um, and the other thing with looking at the strapping, having uh, the, the straps that hold the child in and having a crotch strap so they don't slide down in the chair can be really good because then it reduces the need to then have to keep picking them up and repositioning them. Cot wise, that again, there are loads on the market. So I normally recommend to parents to have a look at different options, different models, see what's going to work for them, their chair and their home environment. Again, the charities like Remap or Demand can do adaptations to, uh, to make it to the side open or they can lift up. Um, but it's really looking to see what's going to work for you. There's a lot, a lot of move now with regards to sort of the Moses baskets to having the, the cots that attach to the side of the bed for early um, sort of younger ch children, younger babies. Um, and that can be quite good for night time that you can reach over comfort baby without having to get out of bed to see to them. Changing table wise, making sure you've got one that's wheelchair accessible so you can get your legs underneath it and consider the height so that you can, that baby's at the right height for you to be able to change their nappy. Making sure all equipment's within easy reach because it's really easy to get halfway through changing a nappy and then realise that you've left them on the, the new nappy on the other side of the room and you obviously can't leave baby unattended at a height. Um, and the big thing I say with changing tables, there are loads on the market and you can spend a fortune on this all singing or dancing changing table, but actually just having a basic table from Argos or Ikea can be just as good. So before you go spending hundreds, look at cheaper options as well. Home layout, it's important just to think about where um, the child is gonna sleep compared to yourself or, or your partner. Um, so the newborns, you can either look at like the cots at the side of the bed or just thinking about where you're gonna position them in the room, if you're gonna have to get out of bed to tend to them in the night. Um, is there enough wheelchair access in the room where you want to position baby to yourself? And then as children get older, it's what's going to happen in the night if they cry out. Are you going to be the one getting out of bed as your partner? Just having those discussions and having that plan in place. And also having an emergency plan if the able-bodied parents out, if there was an incident, say, for example, you fell out of your chair or um, the child went to a place in the house that you can't reach or something like that. It's just knowing what you would do in those situations and just having a plan, even if it's just having a neighbor's telephone number and they can pop around and help if needed. And then for those of you who have stair lifts or through floor lifts with small children, it's really important that you consider the risks of that. Um, usually community occupational therapists will have their own risk assessments that will put in place with regards to that. So it's worth having a chat with them. Safety gates, again, there are loads of different options on the market. So I would be suggesting that if you're looking at purchasing them, that you consider the width of the opening to make sure it's wheelchair accessible to make sure it doesn't affect any turning circles or turning into rooms. Um, if you're a wheelchair user, avoiding having the, the models that have the bar at the bottom um, that you then have to try and get over. There's different gates have either one or two way openings. So just thinking about which way you're gonna open, is there enough space to swing open? 
for you then to be able to get through? Um, is it then going to block access? Um, and also for tech, please just having a thought about the different mechanisms. Some are easier than others from a hand function point of view. Breastfeeding wise, it is possible to breastfeed after spinal cord injury. Um, and normally I suggest to women to use pillows to support the baby, take the weight so you're not having to, to hold the baby um, in your upper body. Um, the, a lot of women find like the V pillows that you have to help support you when you're, when you're pregnant, support the bump can be really helpful for positioning baby for breastfeeding. And then thinking more about bottles, if you go down the bottle feeding route, majority of bottles require good hand dexterity to be able to use them um, or to be able to like screw and unscrew them and set them up with the teat. So look outside the box, look at some of the more unusual bottle designs that are on the market. There are lots of different shapes that may work better for you depending on your hand function. Um, or speak to your OT at your local spinal unit to see if they will look at splinting options with your provide straps to make holding a bottle easier. Um, and to remember if you have reduced sensation in your um, upper limbs, just to think about the temperature of milk when you're testing it to make sure it's okay, making sure you're testing on an area of skin where you've got normal sensation. And also when removing bottles from the heat steriliser because they can get really hot, you don't want to end up burning yourself doing that. Moving on to sort of older children managing toddlers, um, normally recommend to patients to consider reins. I've had one patient who went down the route of a extendable dog lead. <laughs> There's lots of different options available. Um, and just think about in the home environment, what areas the child can access compared to yourself. So if you've got stairs, um, I had one family where the child would run if they were in trouble and sit in the middle of the stairs so the, the parent who was a wheelchair user couldn't get to them. So it might be looking at additional stair gates um, for the children potentially older than you would normally look out for the kids. Um, teach children early disability awareness of what they can do with each different parent. And I think children are really good at picking up anyway on the differences between mum and dad and what they can get away with with one parent to the other. And there is, I think there's a definite sort of automatic sort of development that happens without sort of actually having to put any input into that. And I think as well, it's really important to remember that toddlers and the phases they go through with their behavior are difficult for anyone, regardless of disability or not. So don't be too hard on yourself if you're having a child who's constantly having tantrums or anything like that. Potty training wise, it's just thinking about your physical ability, your sitting balance. Are you going to be able to lift a potty off the floor once it's been used? Is it better to teach your child straight on and off the toilet? There's loads of different pieces of equipment on the market, different seats that will work. One will work for you, basically. It's just finding that right thing um, and how you're going to manage if the child has accidents during the day if you're home alone with them. And then moving on to, as they get slightly older, nursery and school. So just thinking of when you're looking at primary schools, that the access to facilities, um, you don't want to be at the stage where your child's having assemblies or school plays and you're not able to get into the hall to, to watch them because you'll miss out on that opportunity. So making sure that the school is going to work for your needs as well as your child's. Um, if you don't um, live within close distance of the school, is there um, opportunity for you to park on school premises for pick up and drop off or is there somewhere nearby that's going to be suitable for you and also just spending the time meeting with the teacher explaining your disability making them aware of your needs as a parent um, as well is really important so now I'm going to hand over to the lovely ladies who have offered to speak today about their own personal experiences, but I'll let them introduce themselves. Thank you, Helen, for that. Um, yeah, if we could just now hand over to our lived experience speakers today, all of them 
can bring real insight into this area and we're very privileged to have them share their experiences today. So just by way of in brief introduction, the speakers today that we have are Anna Turney, Carol Barrowclough and Emma, Emily Clacy. And I'm gonna hand over to them to introduce themselves and provide a bit of background about themselves. And then we'll be putting some questions to them. And Helen, we'll be coming back to you as well with some questions raised in the chat at the end. Yeah, I've seen. Great. Okay, over to you, ladies. If um, I start, yeah, I'm Anna Turney. I am a spinal injury person. I've had a spinal injury for 15 years um, since I was 26, and I have. Uh, so my injury is T11 incomplete, but I can't weight bearer tool through my legs so I'm a full-time wheelchair user and I have two children a five-year-old who's just started school and a three-month-old baby. Thanks Anna I'm Carol Carol Barraclough um I am a um I have paraplegia at T9 so I'm a full-time wheelchair user I have a complete injury um as a result of transverse myelitis back in 2006 I am a mother to a seven-year-old um, who um, is at school and a delight um, slash shit. Um, Emily, over to you. Thanks. <laughs> um, I'm Emily Clacy. Um, I've been injured 21 years, um, C5-6 incomplete tetraplegic. Um, I have limited use of my right hand and no use of my left hand. Um, I'm a full-time wheelchair user. I've got two girls, they are eight and 11, nearly 12, um, both at school, one about to start secondary school. Um, my first child was a emergency C-section from, um, and she was four weeks early, gave us a bit of a shock. And my second child was um, a vaginal birth after cesarean. So I've, I've had both births. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, ladies. Um, so we have, um, prepared some questions um, for you and then obviously we'll hopefully get some questions in the chat as well to put to you. So um, the first question that we appreciate your input on is what two pieces of equipment could you not do without for your children and I'm talking kind of life hacks here as well as um, you know general pieces of equipment so um, if you could maybe each give your uh, two pieces. Okay, well, I'll start. I would recommend a bed that um, adjusts electronically. That has been brilliant for me. And um, with my first baby, who was a C-section, um, that was imperative because I couldn't, there's no way the recovery was really long and hard. Um, and with my second baby, I've got a, quite a wide bed the modifiers like that with the with the cot attached next to it so it means that i i can get in it i can easily get her feed her um she can we can co-sleep which we do sometimes um and that's just made life so much easier and it means i get a bit more rest um and the other thing for me would be a sling so being able to carry her um all the time anywhere basically is brilliant obviously it's quite hard going up hills with with the addition of a sling and it means I can't drop down curbs and things because um, she, at the moment she's too small and that would be uncomfortable I think for her but um, or definitely can't get up curbs or do anything like that but um, brilliant having a sling. Great thank you Carol. Do you... Yeah um, so when for us bathing my son uh, was probably really difficult to start with so I've got because I'm uh, my paraplegia is T9, I'm relatively stable, but obviously you get to a point where you just keep going. So we pretty much had a bucket that I used to bathe him in. So I would have him transport him from my lap into the bucket that would sit on a toilet because he was so little, it was quite easy to um, kind of maneuver him within the bucket. And then when we moved from him being too big for the bucket, we had a seat in the bath. So again, I think we, forget how robust these things are so I would almost lob him from my lap into this little bath seat but that meant that I could bath him quite safely and he was secure in the bath so if he slipped and I wasn't going to be quick enough to get to him um we did that so bathing 
for us, we use some very basic stuff that's out there. And kind of I echo what Anna said about the sling. Um, for me, because I've got full hand function and I self-propel, I needed to be able to do stuff with my arm. So having him in a sling, um, A, was very comfortable for me, but also um, very good for him because it meant that we could do stuff. Originally, he was um, facing me. And then once he was starting to be pretty interactive, he would face outwards so that he could see and it would almost sit on my lap rather than be supported by the sling. Great, thank you. Um, for me, I, I similar sort of bathing equipment. I used a shallow storage box and put that on the shower chair and it had like a toweling seat in it. Um, and so the baby could sit in the toweling seat and we just fill it with the shower hose and then I was, she was much more accessible. I did get quite wet, <laughs> quite wet feet because <laughs> cause, like, my feet would be underneath the shower seat and she'd be splashing away, but um, but it worked quite well for us. Um, I used a basic desk as a change table and I was able to get a second hand change mat, which had, um, used to, there was a picture of me changing on that presentation from Helen, but um, the, the change table, sorry, the change mat that I had had sides so it stopped the baby from rolling off and then I would be wedged in front of her so she couldn't really go anywhere. Um, and a bumbo seat, which was another picture of me feeding my youngest in a bumbo seat on the table with a little tray. When they're too little to sit in a high chair, they're really good um, because they're at your height and you know you can play, play with them or do whatever. And they're quite secure, the bumbo seat as well. It doesn't really go anywhere. Um, yeah, and sleeping bags, baby sleeping bags for grabbing baby and pulling them towards you when you're feeding. I had a bedside cot too, where the bed, uh, the side just completely dropped down and it was much smaller than a normal cot. So, but it, it still lasted my, both my girls until they were um, in a bed. So um, that was really good. They didn't try to climb out of it, Emily. No, oh, my youngest did. My youngest <laughs> was crawling at um, six months and standing very young and uh, one, <laughs> I remember one day being in, going into the bathroom, put her in the cot. My husband went for a shower in one bathroom and I went into the other one and I came out and she was out of the cot. She was only about seven or eight months old. And I said, did you get her out? And he's like, no. So I didn't hear anything. I literally turned my back for five minutes. So yeah, she did eventually get out of that. She had to go into bed quite early. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, a uh, question on infant feeding. What was your experience with infant feeding? Like if you could share with us if you breastfed or if you bottle fed and if there's any equipment that you would recommend uh, in assisting with infant feeding. Um, I uh, breastfed both my girls. I really struggled with my first. Um, there were so many things against us. She was four weeks early. Um, she was a C-section. I lost a lot of blood in the birth. Um, so I wasn't producing milk very well. Uh, she had a tongue tie. <laughs> um, everything that could possibly be against us was against us for feeding, but it was so important to me to feed her because it was the only thing I felt I could do exclusively for my child. Everything else, every other aspect of her care, I would need help with. Um, so, you know, I, I was determined to do it um, and with a lot of support, it took me uh, 10 weeks to feed her exclusively. So she was a bit bottle and a bit breastfed initially, but I persevered and then eventually fed her for 17 months. Um, and uh, my youngest took to it very easily and fed, you know, straight away, never needed bottle feeding at all, which was great. And I was much more relaxed second time around anyway. Um, and, you know, so that was a lot easier. Um, definitely a breastfeeding pillow, the, the ones which have been in all the pictures that Helen showed with the curve. Um, I use that all the time for carrying the baby, wheeling around with her, feeding her, um, sleeping, you know, you saw a picture of me sleeping on the sofa with both kids draped over me. Um, you know, I just couldn't have done without that pillow. <laughs> it was a godsend. Right. But just to answer the question that was on the chat a minute ago, um, I took oxybutynin for my bladder throughout my pregnancy and breastfeeding um, and seems to have had no detrimental effect to my kids. And it was something that I discussed with my consultant before um, becoming pregnant and feeding. Um, but yeah, I was absolutely fine on oxybutynin. Yeah, so I was, shall I bring that up now as it's obviously <laughs> in conversation? Um, no, I, again, I would be recommending that individuals speak to their consultant. There are some medications that are 
you wouldn't want to be breastfeeding if you're taking but a lot of those medications you potentially may have already had those discussions with your consultant during pregnancy um, because of the risks during pregnancy so I think it's really important to go back to your, your spinal consultant your GP or your um, your consultant in um, Ops and Gynae just to have those conversations in advance so you know what your options are just so that the attendees know, the question that was raised was um, if there are medications um, that shouldn't be taken or um, restrict breastfeeding if you're on medications for spasms, for bladder, etc. So that's that's the question that's currently being answered. Um, Anna, if um, we could come to you on the feed, infant feeding and any equipment that you'd recommend. Yeah, I'm very much in the middle of infant feeding, I'm not literally. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I breastfed both my children, first one for about a year and a half. Um, ha having a, a, a sort of cushion that's strapped around my back or tied around my back is brilliant. Um, and it actually means I can sit in the chair, I can, it, especially if I'm, it's high enough, then I can actually um, have a cup of tea or do my makeup or whatever. It's um, <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah that was one of my essential pieces of kit there's a thing called a breast friend and then I've got a better one I think this time called hippie chick I think which is basically a breastfeeding cushion that ties around your back um so for feeding but also just for carrying them around um and I feed at night but I'm trying quite hard to get my husband to encourage her to take a bottle so I can get out a bit more and not be uh, yeah, no, totally in demand all the time. Great, thank you, Carol. Yeah, so I um I breastfed um also probably till he was just over a year. I struggled initially, but also um, one of the challenges was that he kept losing, um, wouldn't retain heat when he was first born, so he got taken off into um whatever the equivalent for a baby of intensive care was. So he had to almost take um, a bottle quite quickly to be fed. So that kind of helped in terms of he took to a bottle quite instantly. So we did a mixture of breast and bottle. Um, and he also was used to formula and breast. So for me, that was a, it was quite an easy combination. And I absolutely advocate about that pillow. It was a godsend because when they're very little, they don't really do anything. So I was able to move around quite easy with him just still on the pillow. Um, and as Anna said, use my hands to do other stuff because I didn't need to support him because he was at the right height to breastfeed, but it meant that I had two hands to do other things. So that was my experience of, um, of the breastfeeding challenges, shall we say. I heard a, um, Amazing. An article, no, I heard a, a program on BBC, which is still on BBC Sounds called Able to Parent. Um, and they, would, they had a breastfeeding counselor on there saying that disabled people with disabilities are much less likely to breastfeed and have less support. Um, so I think it's worth pointing out that mm. you, you, there is a way, if that's what you want to do, um, there's usually a way to get around it and, and find a way to do it. I think it's a choice thing as well, isn't it? Not everybody wants to breastfeed. So, you know, whatever works with you, don't think that you can't because you have a disability, but if you don't want to, then clearly that's your choice. So. Um, yeah, that'd be a really good program to watch, actually. It's not it was on Radio 4. Okay. Just also to say on um, breastfeeding clothing, I struggled with the things that were on the market. So I just ended up wearing loose tops so I mm. could lift up and then putting a muslin or blanket over my shoulder and covering the baby's head so that my midriff wasn't all on show whilst I was feeding. Um, but it was a bit of a faff sometimes in public because um, I couldn't readjust myself once I was there. So my helper would always make sure that I was covered and she would sit close to me and just keep, you know, putting the blanket back over my shoulder and things. You know, if you're on your own, maybe you could, or with friends, maybe you don't mind friends just sort of sitting around you and shielding you a little bit. Um, but yeah, breastfeeding clothing was just a waste of money for me. <laughs> <laughs> Even if um, you have full hand dexterity, it's such a, sometimes it's such a fact, like trying to find the right, space I, I just wear a vest and yeah. I can pull down and a loose top on top yeah, yeah. they're not well designed are they these things <laughs> <laughs> thank you ladies amazing well um so moving on from feeding then to the other things that the babies do a lot of let's talk 
nappies and how you guys coped with um, changing nappies. So, um, Anna, let's let's start with with you as you are at the cold face as we speak <laughs> with a very little one. How's it going? Um, what are your tips? Actually, so when I had my first baby, I, I think before having her, I was in Stoke Mound about having physio and someone had donated a cot which has front opening doors, but it's also um, high enough for me to get my legs under. Brilliant. Um, so at the moment I'm using that as my nappy changing space, um, which is great because it's big enough. I've got all my stuff organized, which is really important. So I've got it all there. Um, I can lock the door so I can put her in, um, shut her in, go and get some water or go off and wash my hands or whatever. Um, and yeah, so I think the most important thing is be organized and make sure that you can be comfortable while you're doing it. Because if you're trying to do it sideways all the time, you're just going to hurt yourself um, or get some injuries. Yeah, so being organized and having a safe space to do it is probably the main thing for me. Fantastic. And Carol, what about you? Yeah, so kind of what Helen was saying in the presentation, I was given um, a changing table, which um, was perfect, except where the shelf was for all your clobber was exactly where I needed to be. So we simply just removed the shelf and then I was able to wheel directly under the changing table. So that was the perfect height for me um, and it was quite secure. It just meant that he was the right height. And when we were out and about, I would eat, certainly when he was very little, I was still able to just do it on my lap, but also the drop down um, changing units that you find in the, the loose were almost the right height, maybe a little bit uncomfortable, but given that it wasn't you know, a daily occurrence, they were pretty much okay. What I did struggle with when I was out, when you had mats on a, um, like a, a bathing table, so you might have the sink and then you would have a mat on a, a plinth that struggled with because that was kind of a sideways thing but again the, it, you did it a handful of times so in the scheme of things it wasn't a major deal okay and emily um i couldn't physically change the nappies um uh so i was always in the, in the first instance i was made i was made sure i was available and um there for the baby so when the nappy was being changed the baby could look at me and i could talk to her and and speak because she was aware that I was there. Um, the novelty soon wear off and I didn't mind somebody else taking the baby off and change them quite quickly. So um, when I was out and about with my helpers, um, I was quite happy for them to go off and uh, take the baby for, for a nappy change whilst I sat with my friends and drank tea. <laughs> um, pull-ups were quite good um, later on because they're a lot easier to, you know, obviously a wriggling baby trying to get legs in anything is challenging, but they're much easier than trying to um, slot the, bait, the nappy underneath and sticky tape and everything and making sure it's not loose. And, you know, because the worst thing is when you can't do it up tight and you lift the baby up and it just falls off or it leaks out the side. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So um, getting out of the house, I suppose, with a newborn or a toddler or some a child of school age can be challenging even at the best of times but have there been occasions when your injury has made this harder and if so can you offer any advice to other mums with spinal cord injuries out there um if we start with carol okay so um yeah nothing obvious to me i mean my priority was always my son so in terms of my own care i would I, and I still do actually, um, because he's a delightful early riser. So I try to make sure that a worst case scenario is I've managed my bowel. So all I need to do is get dressed. Um, and and you know, so at least I'm in some form to attend to him. And this is always the case when he was little, I was always very much, I would get up early, do my bowel routine um, and yeah, plan to be dressed by the time he got up. So that still is very much um, the same for me. Um, I think you know, just be conscious that everything is a challenge when you're a new mum. You want to do everything. You want to be everywhere. Trying to remember everything, whether you've got a disability or not, is still you know, just tough. Um, we choose to um, walk to school because we can walk slash push. Um, I could drive, but it's just an extra flaff. So walking is a much better, easier option for us. Um, and I think just... Um, 
you know, being conscious that children, certainly as they get older, refuse to carry anything. I don't know any, I don't know whether it's the same for parents who don't have um, a disability. It's the minute they come out of school, it's they are, that's for you. You deal with that, forgetting that you need your arms to physically leave the, the premises that you're in. So um, yeah, that's probably all I could say on that. Great, and I think you recommended star wraps before? I recommended Star Wraps. Ah, you. Anna, yeah. yeah, over to you, Anna, then. <laughs> They're amazing. Uh, basically, it's like a, a, a star-shaped um, fleece thing that you just put the baby's arms and legs in, but it's really stretchy and really easy. If anyone's ever tried putting like an actual coat on a baby or a, one of these little ski suit type things, um, like you're there like trying to force its little arms and it doesn't want to bend its arms or whatever. Um, but the Star Wraps are great. Um, and really easy to use. And I, I think just trying to get out of the house is tough. With the whole school thing, I've my daughter's only in reception, but I just take her book bag and stuff it down the back of my chair. So it's um, down my back, it's probably not ideal, but works for us. Um, and you have, yeah, I think you have to just be organized and have things where they need to be. So you've got your, your bag ready and um, you've got the child ready. It's, I'm still learning about that. And where are we? Like nearly past Easter. We're in the summer term already and I still haven't got it sorted. But um, <laughs> the other day, yesterday, we were too late out the house to, um, to walk up to school again or push. And so we ended up driving, but it was all a bit of a rush. I rushed out the house. Then I got to school, realized I hadn't got the baby sling. I just got the children and um, so I said to my five-year-old, he's luckily quite confident, um, right, I haven't got the sling, so I, it's gonna be really hard for mummy to push, to get out the car and push with the baby up to the, your classroom. So what we'll do is we'll just stop and wait till one of your friends goes by. Um, and so I, I just sort of collared someone and she, they helped her walk into school. So I think in many ways, um, we're giving our children something extra because we're teaching them to be more responsible. We're teaching them to be a bit more independent than most children would be um, because we do have these extra challenges. Yeah. And um, Emily? Um, I think, uh, well, I echo what everyone says about being organized. I think you have to be more organized with a disability anyway, because you've got to always remember um, where things are and, and what you need when you're going out on trips and things. But um, I, with my kids I think I initially tried to sort of overcompensate by doing too much or you know overcompensate for my disability with wanting to, to to be all things to all people and doing everything all the time so as a consequence they've all got too used to me shouting orders constantly and none of them can remember anything including my husband <laughs> so um do do teach people responsibility and independence because it's um it's your downfall later on otherwise but <laughs> Um, we're lucky enough to live close to school too. So I use a manual chair in the house and then I transfer into a powered wheelchair when I'm out and about because I can't push for long distances or get up and down curbs or anything. Um, so I just transfer into my powered wheelchair and the kids um, lumber everything on my lap, including now we're at the age where we've got violins, music bags, um, football kits and God knows what. So I look like a pack horse every time I leave the house. <laughs> Even my husband started refusing to carry things now and I end up carrying everything for everyone. I'm like a shopping trolley on wheels. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm trying to teach my oldest now that if she forgets things, it's her own fault. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I can't remember everything for her all the time anymore. I'm fed up with it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, and we know that, sadly, accessibility is an ongoing issue in the UK. Um, have you faced any challenges um, on this and what advice would you give to other mums in relation to accessibility? Um, if we start maybe with um, Anna. Um, so the school I doesn't have, they do have disabled parking, but they're not in the right place. They're across the road. Um, they're not that near to the school. So I, and being pregnant, um, with COVID, you obviously have to do the whole one way system. And I had to drop down a couple of quite small curbs, but not ideal. So I mentioned this to the school and they've been really helpful and they've got the um, relevant person out from the council. And so they're gonna move the disabled space or 
put in an extra one in a better place for me. And they're gonna have a push button power open doors, which are gonna be better. So they have, they are making um, changes, which is great. I haven't, uh, I think there's been the odd class that I've not been able to go to, which is annoying, Or, uh, but I've just got around it. I did a yoga class, which was the one thing that really kept me sane, I think, throughout the whole new baby bit the first time. And so getting on and off the floor, which I was totally independent doing, was difficult for me after the C-section um, and obviously difficult with a baby. So I think I had to be OK to say, oh, could you just hold my baby while I get on the floor? Or could you help me? So the yoga teacher would like help me back in my chair. So it's it's finding a way around things, isn't it? It's um, getting the support you need and being able to pass the baby to someone was good. Um, uh, I did fall out the chair once, which when I had the new baby and I was in a new chair and I hadn't expected it to react so differently. And I was literally just pushing along a busy street. Um, and suddenly I was on the floor with the baby, the smallish baby in the sling on me. But luckily, um, I think people do want to help. Like most people want to be helpful. And I ended up, some, someone took the baby. I was able to get back in, had, had the baby back. <laughs> It was a bit of a shocker, but in a way, I think, well, people are happy to help. They want to help and um, they're learning things. As long as you advise them and they actually do what you ask them to do, then that works. It's when they, you know, you say, can you just not touch my chair? And then they move your chair. That's when it gets annoying. But I think people do want to help. It's just making people aware that you're a wheelchair user as well is before you go and just planning it out. Yeah. And what about you, Carol? Um, so I, we had really struggled to go to classes when I was pregnant. We went to the venue um, that was the closest to us, but the classes were upstairs. There was a lift, but nobody had the key to the lift. So we were like, now what do we do? And kind of the ironic, well, your husband can go up and have the class. Well, <laughs> very lovely. But um, so it kind of it, it double saw because we then ended up having one-to-one -one sessions so the we had a like an intense period where someone actually came to the house and we went through the same that we would have done had we gone to the classes so that was brilliant from a learning perspective but not so good from a uh, interacting with other mums mm -hmm. um but also during that one-to-one -one session she specifically said to me so will your child have a disability it's like uh it's not like contagious <laughs> <laughs> you you know you're gonna leave the house probably not with a spinal cord injury you'll be all right and um, so yeah so that was probably my my biggest challenge in terms of access but it also meant that I missed out on connecting with other mums because I didn't have those sessions mm -hmm. um and then the school same thing for me I was really lucky in that the teacher invited me in to do a kind of a wheel around the school and what was accessible with a with two eyes on on it a for me as um a parent with a disability but also they don't have any children at the school with a disability so it was also a good almost a, an easy option for them to invite me in to have a look around to see how a child might react and what would work or what wouldn't work for the for the child and as the as my son will go through the school he'll move around different areas so at the moment while he's in key stage one it's fully accessible when he goes to key stage two there are areas that are a little bit off limits so we've talked about how we would work with parents evening if we ever go back to parents evening in the traditional sense um so yeah so they've been really receptive and i think kind of echoing what anna said just tell people what doesn't work and you know, rather than just grumble about it and find it annoying they're pretty much going to accommodate you because they have to so um yeah thankfully it's not worked out so bad that's helpful and emily um, yeah, we found um, initially that sort of schools and nurseries were dictated a little bit by accessibility. Um, we moved from the city when Freya was two to the country. So there was a lot smaller schools locally where we are now, village schools that were in old buildings. Um, luckily, she's gone to the biggest sort of school in, in the village. Um, and that is relatively accessible. They did actually have a disabled um, pupil. So uh, they had disabled toilet. It's all on one level anyway. Um, but over the years that she's been there, because she's leaving this year, 
um, they have um, done more work to the school and, and they did, again, like you, Carol, they asked me to go in and advise them what would be helpful and what wouldn't. Um, so they had power assisted doors and things. And we've not always had the situation where it's been easy um, with uh, like ballet classes, for instance, and my daughters, um, I have got a system in place with the teacher where, because um, I have to drive to it, rather than get my lift out of the car and get my power chair out every time, which completely drains my battery on my car as well for five minute journeys. Um, the ballet teacher sends one of her helper pupils out and they come and get my youngest daughter from the car and they take her off to ballet and likewise they bring her out. Um, and then I share lifts with friends as well. So um, that makes life a bit easier too. Um, but it's just asking for help. <laughs> I mean, you find these problems wherever you go, whether you've got a baby or not, don't you? If you want to go out for an evening with friends, you've got to find out first if the place is accessible or not. I think also I found the postnatal group friends that I had initially didn't really want to invite me to their house because they, you know, you know, for hosting sort of coffee mornings and things initially. I think they rather than ask me what whether or not I could come and if there was anything I could do to help get me in, a few of them were a little bit like, didn't ask me at all so I ended up hosting all the coffee mornings but then um that was sort of my NCT group and then I met a, a group of postnatal girls and they've been amazing not, not one of them was faced by my disability ever and they've always sort of gone oh can I help you and you know how can I get you into my house I've got a step at the front I'm like I'm, I can turn up in my car I've got a manual chair you can help me up the step and once I'm in I'm fine you know as long as I don't stay past the point of needing the toilet we're okay <laughs> So you just got to talk to people and not be shy, be confident in um, asking for help. Amazing. And I mean, what, what about those? So this is a, a, something very close to my heart at the moment because I have um, a 19 month old who um, won't stay still for two seconds and is into everything and is a bit of a, a flight risk. So um, can we just sort of go through your experiences of um, the the toddler years. Um, Anna, maybe starting with you and any like tips you might have for people? Um, yeah, someone recommended a retractable dog lead um, and I did actually get one, but I didn't get very far with using it. Um, and then I found a thing called a boomerang, which was, I think, initially designed for twins. So they've got ones, basically you tie it around your waist and then there's a sort of retractable lead or two if you've got twins. Um, and you would tie it around the baby, the little toddler's waist. So they can go a certain distance and then they stop. Um, it's a bit like reins, but doesn't then get caught up, you know, um, and you don't have to hold on to it either. That worked quite well once she learned how it worked. Um, oh, they're into everything, aren't they? Yeah, I've got all that to look forward to. Um, but I think part of it is training the child. And a lot of people with disabilities would say, um, the child learns the boundaries. So, you know, there's a road, there's absolutely no question about whether, you know, you're gonna sit on me while we go in this dangerous place. Um, and I think children are quite receptive to understanding the, some of the safety aspects. But yeah, mm. I, think, I think you can train them to some degree. Hopefully the next one will be also be trainable this <laughs> baby. Carol, what, what, what about you? What, what do you recall the toddler years being like? No dog lead going on here, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, I, I went for reins, um, which again brings its own challenges because you're trying to push and then you end up kind of wheeling off in one direction because they're wandering off and you can, you've can you only got one hand free. But it worked for us. And Helen, you touched on the your parents, different parents understanding and the children kind of appreciating that parents can do different things so with me he was absolutely fine in the reins that's what we did the minute he could walk he was in reins because it was too heavy to sit on my lap but with daddy absolutely no it was almost as if he knew daddy was absolutely capable of sprinting after me if I was a little terror and ran off but mommy can't so um it was it really quite perceptive and we've kind of seen that certainly as he's grown up um you know we go to the park after school and if it's boggy, it's a blooming nightmare. And he'll be like, we won't go to the park today, mama. But with daddy, it's like, well, it's not an issue. You've got feet, you can get wet, you can mooch across with me. So um, yeah, reins were pretty much key for me. And then at home, um, I think I gave it to you, Anna, but we had a, a pen, which enabled me to kind of put him in 
so that when I needed to answer the door or I needed to go to the loo, he was um, restrained, but he absolutely hated it. So whilst it did the purpose that it did, we kind of used it as a playing area as well because we thought, well, we can play with balls and we don't have to scamper around to get them. Um, he wasn't keen on it, but it did the job. It did a great job for me. I love the <laughs> playpen. And like everyone used to have a playpen. It's just not quite so in fashion now like 40 years ago or whatever. Uh, they are a bit bizarre though, aren't they? Like enclosing your child in this thing. It's a, it's a weird concept, but yeah, it has its purpose, doesn't it? I think it's brilliant. You can go off and have a shower or whatever you need to do. We used a travel cot instead of a playpen. So okay. Put the baby in the travel cot, but um, with the, my two, my eldest didn't start walking until about 15 months. She was quite a slow learner with walking and and crawling so I was quite lucky and lured into a false sense of security <laughs> because as I said earlier my second one started crawling at six months and was walking by 11 months so she was a complete nightmare by comparison <laughs> um, and just wanted to do everything her sister dad did as well. Um, my uh, friends I noticed when they used to come around my house their kids were much more hands-on grabbing things and because my worktops were lower and the drawers were more accessible and things they were always into everything whereas mine have never been like that I don't know if that is a, a boundary thing because of my disability or if it's just my children I'm not really sure but <laughs> but um it was never a problem they knew what their restrictions were in he, in our house and what mummy could and couldn't do and I used my voice to uh, be more commanding than um, physical aspects because you know a strong firm no stopped my kid in their tracks um, doesn't anymore but it did then <laughs> <laughs> so when it was when it was important it, it worked <laughs> okay. um, we know that help can come in many different forms it may be family member or a carer or PA and well, I know that one of the uh, attendees has asked if any of you ladies have support workers and how and if you do how you manage them so um if we could maybe ask you how have you felt about needing help with your children are there um points on that that you could share with your experiences with us starting maybe with emily yeah um i've had different help over the years i was quite I was independent in my personal care before I had children. So I didn't, I just literally got rid of full-time care about two years before um, my injury. Um, and, uh, you know, I was living a nice life with my husband, just needed help occasionally from him and that was fine. Um, so when I, when it came to sort of deciding what help I wanted with the baby, um, I found it quite hard. I thought, I don't want a carer because I don't need personal care. I don't want a nanny because I don't want a nanny to come in and take over the role of parenting. Um, and somebody um, suggested doulas to me. I'd never heard of a doula before. Um, and so basically it's a mother's help. Um, and I found two lovely postnatal doulas who worked with me. Uh, they did one did three days, the other did two days a week um, when my husband was out at work. So they would come in about half seven, eight o'clock in the morning and they would leave about half six, seven o'clock when he came back from work. And um, so they would do a bit of the housekeeping and help me with um, getting things ready for dinner and stuff. Um, they were really supportive through breastfeeding um, and knew a lot about it too. And they were very nurturing with the baby, but they were very much about empowering me to be mum. And, you know, no, and we discussed sort of what the boundaries were at the beginning, but they were much more mindful of it perhaps than a nanny might have been because they weren't expecting to come in and take over. Mm -hmm. And over the years, the um, help I've had has changed because my children have become more independent. And once they started going to school, I didn't need somebody so often. I found it hard at times because trying to find somebody that would do, um, like for instance, my um, eldest went to nursery on um, three days a week from, eight till six, I think it was, and then two days, no, or two days a week, sorry, and then three days a week was at home. So trying to find someone that will work part-time with you. Um, now I've got somebody who was a, a nanny once before, but is now a housekeeper. Um, and she works with me um, from, she works three days a week and she works um, only four hours a day. So she comes in and helps me with all the washing and things. 
but during the school holidays she's around if I need her and she's also available to help with the kids when I need her to as well so she's quite flexible which works really well so it's just sort of you have to keep going back to the drawing board and thinking what what are my needs now and what kind of support do I want um and it's sometimes it's worked and sometimes it hasn't you just have to keep you know trying with different people really great um and what about you Anna um so after the c-section I had some support but it was only really to with cleaning the house and unfortunately I don't have that anymore so my house is less clean um <laughs> and I'm constantly doing laundry and getting fed up with it but um we're really lucky with grandparents living quite locally and, and coming and helping. Um, yeah, so okay. that's been my life. So really. And Carol? Yeah, I, I was independent with my care um, and my husband took a month off. Um, so like Anna, I had an emergency C-section. And I think I was that really threw me because I was expecting to be up and running quite quickly, um, but I wasn't. So that was a bit of a shock. But yeah, thankfully, he was around for the first month. And I think every, anybody with a spinal cord injury is pretty resilient and will ask for help even though they don't want to. They know that they have to because there's certain things that they can't. So I think being a parent, it almost seems automatic that there are going to be things that we can't do. Therefore, we have to say, you're going to have to help me to do this. Um, so I don't think it's accentuated by having a child. It's just an acknowledgement. It's, an, you know, it's a, an added downside if you like to having a disability that you are going to have to reach out and get support for certain things great um i think we've just got a couple more questions if i know we did say it would be an hour but I, hopefully we can just ask you a couple more questions ladies just to let the uh, attendees know we won't be too much longer but just to use their knowledge whilst we've got them um, well, I had one, this will just be my final question, and um, we have focused quite a lot on, on the physical um, aspects of parenting, but I just wanted to, to touch on, on the more sort of maybe more emotional challenges that, that you all face and, um, you know, whether you had any experiences you wanted to share um, with the people from, from that aspect. Um, maybe Emily, start with you, if that's all right. Yeah, um, I found my first child when I had her I found that really challenging and I might as might go almost as far to say I find it more challenging than my actual disability um because of me I was left with another person to look after who was also affected by my disability um <coughs> I found that I, I think also the combination of having an emergency c-section and um struggling with feeding and everything else and then having to accept accept help again after fighting quite hard to become independent um I think it was just all a massive overwhelming situation and I I did struggle quite a lot um and no sleep didn't help <laughs> um but uh you know it's, it's such a rewarding thing having children um that eventually I think you start to realize that most of the struggles that you have are exactly the same as any other mum and it, that's why it's so important to have other mums for support because you, you soon, soon start to rationalise everything and realise that, you know, I might be blaming my disability for all these different things that are making things harder, but actually every mum's going through the same thing. Am I good enough? Am I doing the right thing? You know, is it, am I damaging my child eternally for doing this? You're, you're never going to, you're going to constantly have that constant guilt feeling for the rest of your life. But, um, you know, you're not the only one. That's the main important thing to realise. Fantastic. Carol, what about you? Yeah, I would echo what Emily said, to be honest. Um, you know, it, it is challenging. I think whether you've got disability or not, being a parent is hard, um, you know, full stop. Um, and yeah, having a disability just adds to those the woes that you have. Um, and, you know, I touched on it before, the emergency caesarean for me was the the, had the bigger impact than I really thought it would do you know you, you can't prepare yourself when you're a new mum for what it's like to be presented with a child it's quite cruel isn't it you're already tired and then that's it sleep is out the question for months and months and months um but physically the emergency cesarean was the the thing that knocked me but mentally it was you were tired you're tired you're a bit all over the shop because hormonally of the way it is but as Emily said I think it's no different to any other you know, 
mum. Um, we all go through it. We just have other challenges to deal with on top of being a mum. But we chose to be mums, you know. Um, that was our decision. So, um, you yeah, know, we're lucky. And it's about fighting and being resilient to get on with that. Amazing. Anna, any words of wisdom? Um, just echoing that, I think, you know, you're just another mum. You may, may have a disability on top of it, but actually I was worried about all the same things as all the other people. So reach out and get support and make mum friends and talk to other people, people with spinal injury. Carol's relatively local to me and as an SIA worker, um, she came and we had a few really nice lunches and um, Carol gave me the sling, you know, so, so advice on kit and all of that sort of thing is absolutely brilliant. You know, it's so helpful. Right. Um, we have had a couple of questions come in. So um, I don't know, it might be, this might be one for Helen or equally one for you ladies. Um, managing vaginal tears or episiotomies um, in terms of care, um, I think the question's aimed at. So I don't know, Helen, I have to be honest, and I don't have much experience in that area. Usually those kind of issues don't fall really within the remit of OT. Um, so it would normally be the midwives that would be advising with regards to that rather than myself. Sorry. I, I recently had one, so I might be able to help. Um, <laughs> and it's somewhere that I don't have sensation. So I was quite, it was quite concerning for me before having a first baby, how I would manage that. Um, actually, I had a small episiotomy. Um, really good stitches, the healing was amazing. Um, another mum in a wheelchair I spoke to about before having my second delivery, which was forceps. And um, she said that hers also healed really well. And the, mid the midwife had said that maybe because you're sitting, you're kind of holding it in one place. Um, so maybe that could even possibly help, but there's no science behind that. But um, I was, really concerned when I was doing transfers. So I was trying really hard to transfer really carefully. Um, but mine he healed really well, so. Um. I had a tear um, and I also hemorrhaged afterwards, um, but I had you know, a lot of blood transfusions after, which made me feel better. And I healed very quickly with the tear. Um, you get a lot of aftercare, the nurses will come out, um, check your stitches and, um, you know, I had pads and things for, for afterwards, but I was, it all healed well and fine. Okay, great. Um, and I think, does anyone have, have any closing remarks just to, to bring an end to the session? Any words of wisdom or that if there's something that you'd like our attendees to go away with today, what would it be, Emily? I wrote that little bit on our um, notes init initially, which I said, if I could go back and talk to my former self, I'd say, don't be such a control freak. Take help when you can get it. It's okay to sleep during the day. The house can wait. <laughs> you have to be everything to all people or uh, everything or be all things to all people. And most of all, enjoy it whilst they're small and they don't talk back. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, Anna? Yeah, I Great advice, thank you, Emily. <laughs> I think everything's a stage and it will pass. Um, and we're designed to do this. You know, you, whatever happens, you will find a way to adapt because that's what really matters to you. So um, don't worry too much about it all before it happens, just roll with it. And um, Carol? Um, yeah, what the ladies have said, but also, you know, and I've said it before, don't think that your disability needs to prevent you from achieving parenting goals. Um, you, you absolutely can do this, reach out, get support. That's what's really important. You know, children are resilient. They will bounce back from most things. They will learn with you. You know, it's a learning curve for everybody. Um, and certainly for those who are looking at becoming parents, um, speak to peers. You know, I have lots of friends who um, are parents, who are brilliant parents, but they don't do it as a wheelchair user. So, you know, there's only, there's certain things that you need to speak to other people who are in the same position about. You know, most of it you'll get from other parents, but do just speak to peers, find out what you need to do um, and don't be bamboozled by stuff 
thinking, well, because I'm a wheelchair user, I've got to get this really expensive equipment and I've got to do this because there are plenty of other options around and you know, just think outside the box. Right, well, thank you very much, ladies. I was just gonna say, I think um, Emily certainly gave us um, the names of maybe like some Facebook groups and things like that. So um, we, when we circulate the, the recording, we can pop those into the email so people will have um, some additional places they can, they can go to as well after this. Well, I can see from the comments that we've had in that the attendees have found it extremely informative. And once again, thank you to you all for um, your input, your knowledge and attending today. It's really appreciated and so inspiring and hearing from you and your experiences, I know will help many other women out there. So thank you all very much. Um, our next seminar that we're running is next week on fertility and pregnancy. So if you've not signed up and wish to attend, then please do so. Thank you very much to everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.